the face of the earth, actions and thoughts must align. You remember. I'm saying this because I want some of you that were not here last week to go back and check. And I remember saying that winning habits refer to basic or primary principles of human effectiveness. And they are the foundation of enduring happiness and success. So if you're going to have anything, uh, if your joy is going to be sustained, and I'm talking about the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. Because on the part of God, everything, I mean, God can never be the one to blame in any given situation because he has already given. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He has already blessed us. So why am I not ex ex experiencing the blessing? You need to check some other things. Do you, who is with me so far? You are still with me. Hallelujah. And perhaps one of the most important things I shared last week is on the concept of paradigm, right? And I told you that paradigm refers to assumptions. It refers to your frame of reference. And I used an illustration, a symbol, to, make, to drive it home to us by saying paradigm is like a map. It's like a map. And we need to pay attention to that map because no matter how fast you are moving towards your destination, no matter how you adjust, Pastor Bero just told us this morning that we are not doing behavioral adjustment, no matter how you adjust your behavior to say, I'm going to step on the brake, sorry, on the accelerator because I want to get to where I'm going on time, if you harm yourself with the wrong map, you are going to get faster to a wrong destination. So as you modify your behavior, as you adjust your attitude, those things are good, but you are going to end up getting to the wrong destination on time, right? And then the last thing I shared with us, among other things, is that we often think we are objective. I find that to be very, very interesting, actually, because mo almost all of us, imagine when you engage in um, conversations with your wife, you engage in conversations with co worker you engage in conversation with your siblings, and then you are arguing about a concept, about an idea. And each of you are projecting your own thoughts to be superior to the other person. But what you don't realize is that it is not, neither of you are really considering the main thing. Why? Because what is happening is that we are not as objective as we think. And I'm not saying some are more objective than, or, than others. Those ones have worked on certain habits, and they have certain habits that has helped them to accommodate other people's opinion, and that has further helped to shape the way they see the world. Do you get what I'm saying? To shape it. So I gave you an example. I, I think that example is so uh, was a very good example. I said, imagine God brought a helicopter to the Garden of Eden, and he asked Adam to describe Helicopter. Helicopter wouldn't come until how many thousands, how many thousands of years later? Do you understand? But will Adam be able to describe that helicopter? The answer is yes. He will go into his experience. He will go into the things he had seen. He had seen before. He had experienced. And he will project those things into the helicopter. And so you'll be hearing things, some funny things. And I remember it was Pastor Ife that really drove this home some years back when he was reading from the book of Revelations and he was talking about, I don't know how many of you will remember, he was talking about the lion, dragon, this one, with the, it looks like one side is like a horse, another one like the face. Many of you are wondering what that is. That is a first century man trying to describe all these sophisticated weapons that some of us are beginning to see in the military around the world. Many of you don't think that. Many of you are actually thinking of a horse. The reason why he called it a horse is because it's the closest thing to what he was, being, was projected before him. God was showing sophisticated technology ahead of time. And the man that was receiving that revelation and penning it down in this, because Armageddon is not going to be fought with horses and sword. <laughs> I don't know if you know that. It's going to be fought with, don't quote me anyway, I think it's going to be fought with. You didn't know what I just did. They said, don't represent opinion for a fact. Don't. So I'm mindful of my language. So this one I'm about to say, I'm telling you what I think. I think Amagedon will be fought with chemical weapons, all kinds of weapons that we have. That's my personal opinion. I don't know what your opinion is. Hallelujah. But this morning, I want to make an attempt to define what a habit is. And when I'm done with that, I want to 
try my hands to describe to you what it means for someone to be maturing or to, mat to be mature. And then from there, I'm going to attempt to give examples on uh, things around personal vision, right? Principles of personal vision. And if I still have time, I doubt it very much, I will be able to go into the introduction of the first habit. I'm not just trying to delay things. I'm really, uh, what I'm teaching you, I'm also trying to follow. I'm looking at my own life and identifying gaps and see how can I fill these gaps with some of these things I'm learning. So if I scream in my room, if I stay up all night, from t which, which is what I do from time to time, just trying to understand it in depth and then search the scriptures to see the one, how it aligns with scriptures so that my mind can truly conceive that which God has given to me, then I think you also should take it that serious. Hallelujah. I don't want to go through the disclaimers this morning, but this is the book I recommend to everyone, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. How many of you have seen this before? There is another book he wrote later called The Eighth Habit, and it's also good for you to read that also. One disclaimer I will just give is that anything that does not align with the word of God, I have not included in my message. All the things I've included in my message are the things I understand and the things I, I can prove from scripture and the very things that I'm convinced of. Is that all right? Is that all right? Yeah. Hallelujah. The reason why I say that is that somebody may say that, Pastor, is this a Christian book? Well, it's a management book, but the principles therein, I see them in scripture. Hallelujah. Amen. I love the way Steve Covey defined habits, and he used three concepts to describe it. He said these three concepts are very important if any habit is going to be formed. If the three concepts are not there, then you cannot form any habit. The number one concept is knowledge. The second one is skill. And the third one, he called it uh, motivation, right? Or no, desire. He calls it desire, okay? By knowledge, we are talking about knowing what to do and why you are doing it. By skills, we are talking about how to do that thing. And by desire, we are talking about the motivation or the fact that you want to do it. These three concepts must intersect. That is, the three of them think about them like circles. There must be an intersection between the three circles, and in the middle of that intersection is where you have habit. When the three of them are present, then trust me, habit is about to be formed. Let's use a very good example, which I also picked from the book here. Imagine you are someone who works in an office, and your co-worker workers, they complain. Why? Because you only, uh, you constantly tell them what you think. You don't listen to them, right? You tell them what you think. You tell them your mind, your opinions. But when they want to give you feedback, you don't have time for that feedback. You are someone who does not listen, right? You don't listen to them. Now, unless you begin to search out the principle principle, sorry, of human communication or interaction, you may not know that you do not know, listen to people. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Your, it will never occur to you that there is a defect, that there is a problem. Because you will carry on as though, what's wrong with him? Why, why is he behaving that way? <laughs> you will complain about people not knowing that there is something defective about the way you are relating with people. So number one, knowledge is important because that knowledge is what brings awareness. It makes you to realize that, oh, this thing, I need to work on this area. But one of the things you realize is that that knowledge is not enough. Because it's possible for me to know what is wrong, but I don't know how to fix it. I don't know what to do about it. I don't know what is the first step, the second step, the third step that I need to take to address or fix this particular situation. So you realize that skill is important. It's not enough for you to know. It's also much more important that you know how to listen. You know that you are not listening to people. That is the knowledge, first step. The second step is how do I go about it? So that skill is very, very important. But one thing we also realize is that it is not enough for you to know what is wrong and why it is wrong or to know how to fix it. It's also important for you to know, for you to want to fix it. That's where desire comes in. 
Because if you have the knowledge, if you know what to do and you don't do it, nothing is going to change. Nothing is going to change. Things change when to, to form new habit because you have the knowledge of what is wrong, you know how to fix it, and you have the motivation or the desire to do it. Hallelujah. Who is with me? Thank you so much. When we say someone is mature, I'm moving to the second concept. When we say somebody is mature, what do we really mean? What do we really mean? Now, I want you to know that there is a natural order of growth. When I say natural, I'm not saying, I'm going to show you from scripture, but I'm saying even in this world, in the world of men, as men interact around the world, Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, whoever, as they interact, there are certain principles that they have to possess that in each of these groups, they can say, this one is mature, and they can point to another person and say, this one is not mature. So it is from that balance, I want to share with you what I call the natural order or natural law, the law of growth. It consists of three things, basically, that the habits I'm going to share they are going to work in harmony with what I'm about to share with you this morning. The first natural order of growth that all of us are born into is called dependence. You were born as a baby. In fact, if you were not taken care of as a baby, we give you, I don't know how many hours we should give that baby. I don't know how many hours or, we, or, or days we should give that baby. The baby is going to die. So in the natural order of things, Everyone is born to be dependent. You have to depend on others. They must take care of you. They win you. And it's going to get to a point where you become what? Independent. A time is going to come that you no longer need anybody to bathe you. You no longer need anybody to feed you. You no longer need anybody perhaps to even house you. You become independent, right? And then as you proceed on the earth, doing your work and doing your own thing, you progress to the third level where you realize that I cannot do life alone. I can't do this thing alone. For me to maximize profit or for me to get to the highest form of joy or the expression of the joy of God, I can't do it alone. I must do it with other people. So you begin to learn the principles of interdependence. So you move from dependence to independence to what? Inter, interdependence. Hallelujah. So when we talk about dependence, I think I've described it. When you talk about independence, you are talking about that action where you say, I can do it. I am responsible. Now, responsible, let me break it down for you because that word, if you break it into two, responsible. I am able to respond appropriately to situations around me. I, am, I, I will tell you more about that as we progress. So when you say somebody is mature, you are saying that that person has left the first stage of dependence and he has become independent. I'm going to dwell a little bit more about being independent. Hallelujah. If I were physically, I just want to give examples. If I were physically dependent, let's say paralyzed or disabled, I would need you to help me, right? If I were to be emotionally dependent, my sense of worth and security will come from what? From the opinion of other people. Is that not so? Follow me carefully. If I were independent physically, I could make it on my own, right? And mentally, I could think my own thoughts. What I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to draw the line between dependent, dependent mindset and independent mindset. If I have dependent mindset, what that means is that I depend on other people. Physically, maybe I'm paralyzed or whatever, I would need other people. I'm just using that as an, as an example. Emotionally, I, the, my sense of worth is not coming from within. It's not coming from who God says I am. It's not coming from scriptures. It's coming from the opinions of people. It's coming from the validation I receive from people. That is how I get my sense of worth. But if I'm independent, it means that it is from inside out. I, I know who he says I am. I know I am who God says I am, right? 
And all those things that we see in scriptures, you are able to say that I can do all things through him that strengthens me. You have independent mind. It doesn't matter what other people are projecting into you as a person. You are free from their positive or negative comment. You have a sense of self-worth that comes from within, not from without. Are you with me? I love to give this example. If you were intellectually dependent, you would count on other people to do thinking for you. <laughs> they will have to think through the issues and problems of your life. So you are not the one considering things because you have a dependent mindset. It's other people that will need to do it for you. They need to point it out for you and they need to resolve it for you. If they don't intervene, um, nothing happens. Hallelujah. So, independence is maturity, right? But as good as independence is, it's not supreme. It's not the ultimate. And the reason why it's important that we look at this is because the current structure in the world promotes independence. They want you to be self-reliant. So you see people saying, my truth. You see people saying, me time. You see people trying to justify the reason why they stopped going to church. It's part of that culture. So there's a culture in the world that promotes independence. And if I do not clarify, you might think that that is what I'm promoting also. But that's not what I'm promoting. Many believers are caught in this web because they do not even know the things that they post and the things that they have, the agenda they are pushing. Do you get what I'm saying? So I'm here to reveal it to you so that you begin to look at it. Much of the things that people are projecting as independence today that makes people to think that I can act alone, I can take, make my own decision. What is really happening is that the exact opposite of what I'm trying to teach. They are reacting to the environment. They are reactive. They are reactive. By the way, the first habit that I want to show us, which I've not gotten to yet, is be proactive. Being proactive means you are not reactive. It means that it is not situations or circumstances that are happening to you. You are the one happening to things. And it's not enough for us to just make that statement. We need to break it down and ensure that we understand it, especially from scriptural perspective. But the point I'm trying to make is that you see that independence that the social norms and all that is pushing is not what I'm talking about here. It's not what I'm talking about here. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. It's not what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. There is a concept that is not widely understood that is called interdependence. And it's so important because if you do not understand the concept of interdependence, you are going to be having issues in some of the very treasured relationships and uh, things in your life. For instance, uh, we see a husband leaving his marriage, and when you ask him for the, the reasons, by the time you sit with that person, you realize a lot of selfish decisions that were made. Certain things were not considered. The only thing that were considered, perhaps, was the attitude of the wife. What about the children? What, what about even the wife? Or what about the husband, as the case may be? Are you following what I'm saying? What about, so they only are fixated on a very narrow thing and they begin to work on it. Um, there are two concepts that, don't worry, um, uh, when we open scriptures, I'm going to stay there for a while and reiterate some of the things I'm saying. There are two concepts that um, I found in that book that I think we need to pay attention to. Two circles, circles in our lives. The first circle is the circle of concern. 
The circle of concerns are usually populated by the things that are outside of our control. Things that we can't do anything about. They are outside of us. We will depend on other people to do something for that situation to change. But guess what? We bring those, we, some of us dwell within that circle of concern. Things we have control over, we live. The things that we don't have control over are the things we magnify and we dwell on. And guess what? That is the reason why we want a good marriage and we are doing everything to have that good marriage. But our language is wrong. Our attitude is wrong. Our mindset or paradigm is wrong. And we want to arrive at the right destination. It is not possible. It's not possible. It's not possible. Something must shift. And that's why we are teaching this. People do their own thing. True independence of character empowers us to act rather than be acted upon. So when you say you are independent, what we are saying is that you have the ability to decide how you want to respond to things. Because of time. Imagine a rectangle divided at the, at the middle. Divided in the middle. One side of that rectangle that has been divided into two is stimulus. The other side, this is not original to me, by the way. The other side is reaction. Hear me clearly. Most of the time, the theories that we are taught upon the earth give us the understanding that we have no control over what somebody has done for us. In fact, because there is no time, I wanted to bring two people out Maybe it will be too much. That for someone to just suddenly slap the other person and see what the reaction of the other person will be. Because we are in church, that will not be successful. <laughs> it will be more successful on the streets. But church, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's just that conditioning. I'm in church. Before the slap lands on some people's face, Because the word makes us, wants us to believe that between stimulus and reaction, there is no gap. But I want you to expand your mind a little bit to see it. Look at a broader thing going on in the world. The economy is hard. What is the implication? The natural thing is that you cut down on church, you cut down on so many other things you are doing. Do you get what I'm saying? Why? It's a natural is it not a natural reaction to the fact that things that I used to buy for five naira is now 20 naira? Do you get what I'm saying? People think that they are helpless and that the environment will continually condition them and make them to act or react in a particular way. But what I'm calling independence is the ability to know and recognize that between stimulus and response, I have the choice, a choice to make. I can decide how I want to respond. When Pastor Benro was teaching us this morning, he said, many of us, how many of you want to change one thing or the other? We all raised our hands. Some that didn't raise their hands, we pray for you. Now, we all raised our hands. There's something we want to do. We want to trim down. We want to cut down me. I want to cut down my blood sugar. And what are you trying to do? You two, you are trying to do one thing or the other. But one thing I believe all of us have in common, we want to make more money. But you know, it will, be, it will be foolish for us to want to make more money, but we are still doing the same thing we were doing last year. Yes, nothing has changed. Nothing, no new thing. Has, so we are still doing the same thing. And your situation is worse off because the economy is not as good as it was last year. So every likelihood, the result you are going to get at the end of the day is not going to be as much as what you achieved in 2022. So that's why this message is important because I'm trying to tell you clearly without missing words that you have a choice to make based on what is going on around you. I've told you about circle of concern. There is something else called the circle of influence. Circle of influence are things that you can change. I can learn a new skill, can't I? Yes, sir. I can form new partnerships. I can walk towards knowing Pastor Bero better so that I can get quality ideas so that I can make great decisions and great decisions 
will deliver a great life or a great year. Is that not so? There are things within my circle of influence. But do you know what we usually do? We always focus on the circle of concern. We don't focus on the circle of influence. The things we have responsibility over. We don't do anything about it. Can somebody make a guess this morning why that is so? Is it not easier to blame the government than to get another degree? Is it not better to say it's Pastor Tokwe that has not taught us this thing than to pick up the Bible and say every day I will spend one hour with the scriptures? How I many of you know what, what I'm talking about? What Pastor Tokwe is teaching, what the government is doing, should be in your circle of concern. Are you happy with it? No. Can you do anything about it? No. But are there things you can do something about? Yes. That's why you will never see me. The reason why I don't comment on some platforms, I love it, I engage, I see what MOI is doing, I love the comments and all that, but sometimes I won't lie to you because of the understanding I have. I'm like, this thing looks like complaint. And someone, my boss will always push for solution. And so what are we going to do about it? Can we know if we assemble? It's always full of ideas on how to bring solution because if we keep looking at the circle of concern and neglect the circle of influence, we, have, we become victims. God has not given us the spirit of fear. He has given unto us the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and of sound mind. That's what the scripture says. Why is it in the scripture that he has not given us the spirit of fear? Because he knows that we're going to encounter things that are fearful. He knows that we're going to encounter things that are outside of our uh, ability to control. And he, no, he doesn't want us to become docile when we get there. He doesn't want us to become inactive when we get there. He wants us to still do something. So what did he do? He gave us the spirit of power the spirit of love and the spirit of sound mind. That you can think through this situation and come out at the end of the day with the right decisions. What Pastor Bruno we call great decisions that will deliver the success you seek or the results that you seek. Hallelujah. So this morning, the first three habits I'm going to be sharing with us, the first one is be proactive. But the first three habits has to do with um, what I call um, just exploring that independence more, moving from dependence to independence, right? That's what it's going to focus on. And the last three, uh, uh, sorry, and the next three habits, four, five, six, we focus more on private victories. You see, it's first, pri sorry, it's first private victories before it becomes public victories. The first three habits I'm going to be sharing, I'm still laying foundation, we focus on private victories. If you don't win the war or the battles within, you can't win the battles without. And you cannot focus on private victories while you are neglecting public victories. It's like you say, um, I want to harvest tomatoes before I plant tomato. It doesn't make sense, right? That's exactly what it is. So you must first focus on this. So the first three is going to do this. But before then, let me share this with you. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. There's something I mustn't forget. To move from dependence to independence is what we are discussing. But to move from independence to interdependence is only a choice that those who are independent can make. The natural order of growth is to move from dependence to independence to interdependence. The only people who can move to, the, to interdependence are those who are independent. The man who is dependent does not have the character to make choices at the level of interdependence. Why? He does not have control over himself. He does not know who he is.
That's the reason why he cannot make those decisions. Proverbs 25, verse 28. Proverbs 25, verse 28. The Passion Translation. If you live without restraint and are unable to control your temper, you are as helpless as a city with broken down defenses open to attack. <laughs> another scripture says, another translation says, he that does not have control over his spirit is like a city whose walls are broken down and is open to attack. So imagine somebody becomes a refuse dumb for nonsense. Any little thing triggers you. What is happening on the outside affects you. You were smiling last minute. The reason why you are no longer smiling is because somebody did something. In fact, when you enter into a room, you look around, and because of certain things you perceive within your heart, your joy is lost. You begin to bone for everybody, to frown at everybody. He that does not have control over his spirit. Now, let me tell you this. You know, there are some people that their day will become spoiled because the weather is, is because it's raining. And you get what I'm saying? Because it's raining. An independent person, in terms of maturity, he carries, he or she carries his or her weather wherever he or she goes. You take your weather with you. You take your weather with you. It is not the weather that controls you. It is your own weather that determines how you deliver on things. Who is with me? He that does not have control over his spirit it's like a city broken down and without walls. I have seven minutes. I can do this exercise before calling it a day. The first habit, be proactive. Turn your Bibles to Genesis 22. Genesis chapter 2. Guys, I pray for you. I prayed for you. <laughs> I'm just confessing. I pray that you will understand, and I pray that this is not just a message, that this is a tool that you're going to make use of in the name of Jesus. Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would do, what called them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. 20. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was none, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Look at verse 23. Or maybe we should continue reading it. Right? 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The point I'm trying to make here is to let you know how man became, what does it mean that man became a living being? Man became that thing Pastor Bero described earlier, that man is the only one who has the ability to self-evaluate. <laughs> man is the only one who has the ability to do that. Animals can self-evaluate. They follow patterns. You can, condition their, their, um, you can condition their behaviors and they begin to do certain things. I've seen a cock playing piano before. Yes, a cock. I've seen an elephant drawing before on YouTube. So you may look at it and say, wow. Don't say wow. A man conditioned that animal that way. It's as a result of conditioning. Man is the only one who has the ability to self-evaluate. <laughs> Can you close your eyes, everyone? Just close your eyes. We are not about to pray. We want to do an exercise. Close your eyes. <laughs> Are your eyes closed? Thank you. I want you to see yourself at the entrance. No, see yourself on the altar standing with me. 
Just close your eyes and imagine it. <laughs> see yourself on the altar standing with me. Now, as you are standing with me, I want you to see yourself sitting where you are right now, from the altar. From, you are on the stage now. You are now looking at yourself where you are seated. Can you see yourself? Answer me. Can you see yourself? Okay. What mood are you in right now? Can you see it? What mood? What is your mood? Are you excited? Are you just there? Are you? Don't answer me. What mood? And how many of you are considering where is pastor going with this exercise? <laughs> you are not really doing it. You are just wondering in your mind, where is he going with this exercise? Open your eyes, everyone. Did you do it? Did you do it? Did you see yourself? Did you see your mood? Man is the only one who has the ability to do that. It is called self-awareness. You are not your actions. It's just what you do. Let me surprise you. You are not your thoughts. Do you know why? Because you can consider what you are considering. Am I lying? You can, you can see what you are thinking. Man, right? You have the ability to see. Look at one scripture. Uh, uh, wait. Before pastor just call out a scripture. That <laughs> so 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. It says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. What gave Paul that confidence to say examine yourself? What did, he, what did Paul mean when he said, test yourself? Because that ability is there in every man. The ability to consider what you are thinking. You know how people say, uh, I can't help it. This is the way I am. It's a lie from the pit of hell. There is nothing so called. You have the ability to consider why you are thinking the way you are thinking. You have the ability to consider why you are acting the way you are acting. You are not that action. You are not even that thought. Because you have the ability to step out of the situation and look at it. And all is happening in your mind. Folks, because of this possibility is the reason why it is possible to change your habits. If we didn't possess this ability, it would be impossible to change our habits or change things in our lives. But because it is possible to think about what we are thinking about, to examine ourselves, to project as if we are outside of ourselves and we are looking at ourselves and we are considering what is going on in our lives, that is the reason why it's possible for, your, for us to change our habits. That's the reason why this message is even possible in the first place. Are you blessed? The last thing I'm going to share under one minute. They say nature abhors what? Vacuum. Because nature abhors vacuum, the society will naturally project things into us. When I say society, I'm talking about so many things. But I don't want to go into the nitty-gritty of them yet. You are never early. You are a failure. You mean you won? He's not celebrating the guy. He was surprised, surprised that the guy won the contract. The people have their opinions that they, are, they will project onto you. Now, if all the way you see yourself right now, your self-awareness is a accumulation, accumulation, sorry, of the, what people have projected into you. There is a description that COVID gave that I want to give, that I want to, give to you. You know, when you go for carnival, it's not common, but those from Calabar know that they, they know what carnival is. And you enter into this funny room 
full of funny mirrors. You know, some, you look in a particular way, it expands your head. And, and <laughs> you know, you see the caricature of yourself in the mirror and all that. If your self-awareness is based on what the society has projected into you, you are like a caricature in real life. You don't know who you are. You don't know who you are. Paul said, examine yourself. Examine yourself. Hallelujah. <sighs> Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 as I wrap up and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became what? Man became a living being. I can continue to expand it. Man became a rational being. Man became self-aware. How do I know that? When he named all the animals, this Bible says, for a helpmate, Adam did not find. When they brought woman before Adam, despite the fact that a woman was physiologically different, he said, this is the flesh of my flesh. This is the bone of my bone. There was something within him that recognized Everything going on around. When he saw baboon or chimpanzee, he didn't say, this is the flesh of my flesh. But when he saw woman, he recognized. He named all the animals. He could understand the vegetation from animals and the things that were going on in his ecosystem. He understood everything. He became a living being. But that's, perhaps that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is what God gave to man. God gave to man an independent mind called will power. The ability to self-determine. The ability to determine how things will happen for him. Am I correct, everyone? Now, God gave him that ability. And it was that ability that man exercised to rebel against God. You know, if God had not created that it will be impossible to test the love of God for man. Many people don't know that. Without the will, uh, what, what, free will that God gave to man, it will be impossible for, for God, for us, to test the love God has for man. Because God risked everything in creating man. Many of us have not seen that. He risked Everything. Let us create man in our own image. To you, it may sound as a simple statement. That statement was the day that God also, permits me to say within this context, God also sealed his own faith. His own faith, sorry, that the FAT, that day. Because that ability he gave to man, man had the awareness to either use it to serve God or use it to rebel against God. This morning, the reason why I'm sharing it with you is to let you know that you still possess it. You have the free will. You have the free will. That time, that thing that is looking as if you are locked up in a corner and it's as if you are going to bust. It's not true. You are just reacting to the environment. You are reacting to what is happening around. You have the ability to decide what your response will be. You are a responsible being. You have responsibility. You are not helpless. Tell yourself, I'm not helpless. I can decide what my response will be in every situation. That's a prayer. That's a prayer. Folks, my time is up. I, by February 19, I like sharing my stories, and I share it because uh, you have not given me permission to share your own. That's the reason. By February 19, I will have been married for 13 years. Nine out of 13, I was not self-aware. 
For you to know how ridiculous that is, I got born again in 1993. I became a Christian leader immediately. So I left that secondary school. I moved to the secondary school. Pastor Benutu were moving together. Moved to St. Matthias. I was a Christian leader too. When they chased everybody out of school, Chaplin said, this is the key to the vestry. You go and read there. That is the level of influence. When I left there, I went to university. By the time I was crossing to part two, I became a past, the pastor of the fellowship. I'm going somewhere with this. I was teaching. I was praying. I was counseling. In fact, on campus, I made up my mind I would not go into any relationship. You know why? Because all my guys were in relationship. My limited understanding told me, for you to be able to instruct them, you must be out of it. That was what happened, but limited understanding. With all that experience, I got married in 2011. Nine years out of 13, I was not self-aware. I was doing things I considered to be right. I did a lot of things that I considered to be right, that by the time my paradigm shifted, I became ashamed of the seemingly good things I did. Do you know why? Those things I did were not wrong in themselves. But I had the wrong mindset for doing those things. I was seeing my wife in a different light. Sometimes I would look at her. It was difficult to look at her and smile those days. I'm not joking. It was difficult. When I look at her, my circle of concern expands until I cannot see the lines. I felt helpless. The year that God rescued me, I had written down that I will become a content creator. Guess what the title of that blog will be? The Diary of a Hungry Husband. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. If I check my journals very well, I must have written one or two articles <laughs> that the Holy Ghost prevented me from posting. Do you know if I had published those things, people would hail me. <laughs> The fellow, the guys who were in my situation will be surround me. I share that to let you know that there are so many things going on and people are thronging those platforms and they have nothing to do with God. Because the person producing that thing is coming from a wrong paradigm. They look good, they look helpful, but they are not of God. I'm using this parable for you. So the day... God rescued me was the day my marriage crashed. And as I was thinking that that thing had been buried, I began to see something jutting out. You know, Job, is it Job 14? He says, there is a hope for a tree that is cut down. He said, at the saint of water, it will sprout again. That is the scripture that captures what happened to me. The day I became self-aware, I'm telling you the truth from the, you know my wife, Rabbi, she's open, right? Engage her. It does not matter what she does. Do I feel odd? Yes, sometimes, till date, I still feel odd. Do I stay there? No, I don't stay there. I'm able to process it. So why are you feeling this odd? The fact that this thing is paining you this much means that there is something you still need to work on. I don't look at her and say, stop doing this. Sometimes when she raises questions about what do you think about this, I give her feedback. But I look at myself first because I can't win private victories if I don't first win, sorry, public victories if I don't win these private battles. I must win these private battles. And it has to do with me seeing things in the right way. Folks, this is the reason why the word of God is working for some and it's not working for others. Remember what I said last week? I said what I'm going to be sharing may sound like maybe some management stuff and all that. See, the mind of the man that is teaching this thing is rooted in scriptures. So what I'm trying to do is to show you things that will enable you to cooperate with the Holy Spirit as he's bringing about transformation in your life through the word of God. The word of God will become meaningful because of some of the things I'm sharing. Because without the participation with the Holy Ghost, we may not see the transformation. God doesn't do it alone. Go and quote me anywhere. I think somebody said it in Google Bed too. But I've known it for a long time. God does not do it 
alone. God is like that father of the prodigal dung, son waiting. It is until that guy came to himself. The Bible says he came to himself. That was when his paradigm shifted. When he came to himself, he concluded, uh-uh, the slaves in my father's house, they dress well, they eat well. What am I doing with pigs? I will go back to my father. Yes, maybe he has disowned me. Yes, he doesn't want me again. I don't have, he doesn't owe me anything again. But at least I qualify to be a slave. And then all of a sudden he showed up and the father embraced him. Is it that the father didn't want him all along? The father wanted him all along. But until his paradigm shifted, the father couldn't do anything. God is helpless with many of us. He's helpless. He's helpless. The word of prophecy is coming from this place regularly. That word, not another word. That word, not the word from another apostle. The very word from prophet Ben Rose Mount is enough. But the reason why it's not effective is that that thing has not shifted. That thing has not shifted. That thing has not shifted. Imagine me in the heat of what was going on between my wife and I. I was angry. I was, I was a hungry husband. Jesus. Those days, I almost died. Guys, I'm talking to someone this morning. There were several nights I locked myself in the room and I said, Lord, I don't want to wake up. Several nights. Several nights. What did she do to me? All because I could not undo what was happening on the outside. All because I didn't understand that there is a circle of influence. That if I focus on those with the help, the scriptures I'm hearing will have effect in me. Folks, I taught a series for more than one month on to be joyful. There was nothing joyful about my life. <laughs> I was like a joke. Were people blessed? They told me they were blessed. Were people sharing testimony? That was when I realized that we are vessels. We are vessels. We are not here teaching our experience. We are teaching God's word. When we teach and we bring out our life, it is how God has bypassed the, what do you call it, the inadequacies of man and put his supremacy upon it to bless the, his people. Folks, this thing I'm sharing with you is life. Get the book. <laughs> Listen to the message, and then read your Bible. Get the book. Listen, follow this message, and read your Bible. Next week, we're going to continue with this uh, first habit, and then we're going to move on. We have enough time to really look at it. At some point, I will break, and we're going to have questions and answer. I'm not going to wait till the end. And during question and answer, um, yeah, me see, I'm just saying before the eyes of everybody. I, I where's Charles? Charles, uh, I need your permission for what I'm about to say <laughs> next. I love you so much, and I love what you do. I love your approach to things, and you inspire many. And so the next one we're going to have, you are still going to anchor it. I'm saying it before everybody so that you start drafting what and what the conversation will be about. So I will let you know what the date is. So we're going to have Q&A, and then we'll move back to talking about the, the, the habits, and then we'll go back into question and answer. Because the end result is not for me to preach. The end result is to see us become a different kind of being. A different kind of being. Folks, we are not there yet. We need to take over this city. And I'm not saying that from a selfish perspective. I'm not saying it from the perspective of this place being filled. I'm saying it from the perspective of I'm in my office and everybody knows what I stand for. I'm in the market. I'm relating with people and they know I'm a Jesus man. And they know I'm sharing. See, until we become a people. Hear this one I'm about to say. is the last statement. And I go. The last statement. Until we become like Jesus, what does that mean? We can use every situation to preach the gospel. When we meet a woman who is a prostitute, our mindset is not to condemn. Our mindset is to look for opportunity to preach. We we'll enter that woman through the situation. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? When we meet a man who is a professor, 
but you know that there is something defective about his faith, we're going to use that erudit, erudity, that height of scholarship to also enter and share the gospel. Who knows what I'm talking about? When you see a man eating bully, you will look at this. This bully reminds me of unleavened bread. <laughs> but do you know there is a bread that is different? When I was on campus, there was a man, if you were in Ife, from 1997 to 2002, there's no way you wouldn't have encountered this guy. We call him, have you eaten today? The man with one of the longest nicknames. Do you know why? He shows up in our early morning class. He knows that all of us, our eyes are somewhere. We're still trying to wake up properly for that early morning lecture, that first lecture. And this guy, before the lecturer comes, and he will be smiling. Everybody will be wondering, what's wrong with this one? Say, Have you eaten today? Everybody will say, no. Say, I'm not talking about that food. And he begins to minister until he took over the entire campus. I didn't say a section. The entire campus got to know the gospel because a man dared to seize moments. Until we start seizing moments, we are not there yet. Folks, I'm not interested in, sorry, I'm interested let, let's not lie. I'm interested in so many things. Let, you know how God corrects us, even on the pulpit. But what I, I'm much more interested when I see every one of us being like that. When that time comes, eh, we don't need more people, folks. Look around you. There are empty seats. We don't need those empty seats to be filled before this old city is taking over. That's what this is about. So start practicing it. Every opportunity you have, somebody is sitting at Bado beside you or cassava. <laughs> Instead of saying, I don't go grieve. <laughs> you have to grieve for some people because of the gospel. Am I saying that is the agenda? Bible says, lie not one to another. That is the agenda. If you see yourself tomorrow, Sharing your faith with someone, you are doing exactly what Pastor Tokbe said we are about. You are doing it. You are, you are very early. And everyone is applauding you. If you don't keep quiet when you are in the Uber, when you are, you are, you are riding a Uber, uh, uh, an Uber? You are in, you are in Uber. You are in Uber. <laughs> no article. <laughs> but you know that you can share something with that person. Let me tell you a secret. I have discernment. I'm not boasting. I have discernment. If I take a chair and I sit down here and I decide to pray for you one after the other, I will not repeat the same thing. I may be quiet at some point to receive the word, but I will say things that I think is going on in your life. I'm not saying it to boast. I'm saying it to let you know that we all have it. That's the point. You didn't get it. You thought pastor was boasting. I'm saying we all have it. We will not experience that power until we start working in it. It's available. These signs will follow those who believe. Eh? God also confirming their words with signs and wonders and various miracles, Hebrews chapter 2, according to his will. So what does that mean according to his will? When I'm witnessing to someone, I am expectant that God can just speak through me. God can just do something through me because according to his will. So I'm expectant. I know he already said he will accompany what I'm saying with this. We will not see that power until we step out. Step out. Step out. You see that power you will see will later not only be important for the assignment of evangelism, it will also be important in your own life. Do you get what I'm saying? Because the gift of God is without repentance. So once you walk in it and you understand that move and ways of the spirit, he stays with you. In your own personal situation, that same thing, that skill in the spirit, we kick in. Are you blessed? Are you sure? Can we pray for one minute? Rise to your feet one minute. One minute of stirring your heart together, of stirring our hearts before the Lord. One minute. One minute. One minute. See, there's something I'm not doing. Usually I will speak in tongues and then you will follow me. I don't want to do that. I want to follow you. I want you to speak in tongues and then I want to follow you. <laughs> so let me hear you. Let me hear you pray. Let me hear you pray. 
Let me hear you pray. Pray like someone who has received something. Pray like someone who is expectant of great things from God. Pray like someone who knows the Holy Spirit is a helper and is going to help you do the things you have heard. Pray like someone who knows that this city is for the Lord and you are the instrument that God is going to use. Pray like someone who knows that the things of the past, they belong to the past. It's a new day. It's a new territory you are charting. Pray like someone that knows that something new has started. Pray like someone with understanding of what God is doing right now in your life and around you. I really want you to convince me, but you are not doing, you are doing a bad job at it. Pray, pray. Don't be afraid to pray. This is your father's house. I can scream if I want to. I can shout if I want to. You have the permission. Reko babadosh. Reko super lega libra handa la badosha. Leko so patata yada la da 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 ba da 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 badosh. Reko so palaka yada la ba 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 badosha. Leka ta yada la ba 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 badosh. Le sutopia da libra handa la badesh. Reko pakata yada la ba 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 ba. Raku so palianda la badesh. Reko so pakata yada la ba 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 ba. Reka ta yada. There is such a thing as praying into your being, into your spirit, the things you have heard. Look at the short moment Pastor Bero had. Look at how powerful, how impactful. Look at the word that you heard. Imagine this word permeates your system and it forms the thoughts and the decisions of your life. Imagine that. Imagine the quality of life you are living. Before men, you are not just one of the numbers. You are one of those that God is counting on. You are one of those that heaven is depending on. So when the Lord said, who shall we send? There is a permanent yes on the table of your heart. A permanent yes. Reka tuzo palia gada radosha, reka pakata yada la ba 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 ba. Reko so palaga yada. Nobody has any excuse. All of us can walk in great power. We can walk in the full potentials of who God has made us to be. The Bible says, as many as believed Him, to them He gave the power to become, to become, to become power, to become children of God, to become children of. God, children born not of natural descent, not the will of a father, but born of God. You were born by a man, but now you are born of the Spirit. You trace your lineage not just to a human father, but to the heavenly father. So the Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ. Let this mind be in you. You can possess the mind of Christ because you belong to the lineage of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 2, it says we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. He said who has known the mind of God that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Lord, we have changed our ways. Lord, we have embraced a new path by the help of your Spirit. There is a new way that we think is called gospel principles. A new way of thinking. A new way of thinking. There is a new way we do things from today. It's called gospel practices. A new way of doing. There is a new way we experience God and the things of God. 
It's called gospel power. A new way of confirming that which we think, which we do, the Holy Spirit confirms with great power. It's a new assembly from today in the name of Jesus. I didn't hear you. It's a new assembly from today in the name of Jesus. This city of Abuja, we know that we are here equipped, empowered with the gospel of grace. This city we know in the name of Jesus. This assembly is not beggarly. It's not a victim. It's in the offensive with the gospel in the name of Jesus. We uproot and we plant. We pull down and we build in the name of Jesus. Thank you for a new dawn that has come upon us. And indeed, we declare one more time, it's a new beginning for us in the name of Jesus.